good. Okay, next up, Ibu Raz. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give you a kind of a of the... Uh, he's not on. I'm going to turn the mic on, so it a little better. So I thank the, the organizer for priming with the opportunity to give you an overview of the different work we did during these la last uh, years concerning the formation and evolution of dwarf galaxies. Uh, because people complained yesterday that simulators only show what works, I decided to show you some slides um, about difficulty we are facing. Uh, by the way, all along this talk, I will also emphasize this, how dwarf galaxy may help to constrain the smaller scale of the universe. So let me first remind you that dwarf galaxies are the most abundant objects in the universe by number, they are the faintest ones. Um, they are really important in this sense, they may have played a major role during the epoch of ionization, and uh, they are probably building blocks of larger systems. So it works trying to really understand <coughs> those galaxies. Um, dwarf galaxy means by itself not much that all galaxies with a luminosity lower than 10 to the nine. In this talk, I will more concentrate on um, galaxies with a luminosity below 10 to the six, 10 to the eight, something like this, and dwarf galaxies that are observed in the local group. I wanted to remind you that, in fact, at the beginning of this century, very few dwarf galaxies were known around the, the Milky Way, uh, I mean, like 12. <coughs> and thanks to deep survey, this number increases very strongly up to now 60 dwarf galaxies observed around the Milky Way. If you look at dwarf in the local group, it's up to 130. So we have lots of objects now. Um, among these, uh, population, there is a very interesting population that has been discovered now about 15 years ago, that the so-called ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. We have now uh, nearly 50 of those galaxies observed. They are characterized by the very low uh, luminosity below 10 to the 5. I will dedicate a few slides to those objects. Among them, the faintest of the faintest is Segway. Just to give you an idea, this galaxy has only 200 <coughs> solar luminosity, so very, very small and faint object. Dwarf galaxies are small objects. Uh, they may be super useful to constrain the smaller scale of the universe. And I like to show that through the total matter power spectrum that you see here. And you see that uh, this famous uh, image show that there are many constraints. However, if you go to very small scale, <coughs> we have no idea about the shape. There is no existing constraint. The point I wanted to make here is that if you turn <coughs> the wave number which is there, to halo mass, this is what you get. It's something between 10 to the 9, 10 to the 6, so this is exactly what will impact the dwarf regime. So studying dwarf galaxy indirectly tells you about the uh, shape of the power spectrum at a very small scale. Uh, because they are small, they, um, well, it's well known that they challenge the lambda CD and Pranig. Aaron just talked about the different issue, well, the different challenge like the cusp core, the missing satellite, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's nice because I, <laughs> I wanted to also mention this very nice paper from Loa Salas, Andrew, and Ati Fatai. So if you are interested in this issue, just look at this paper. I won't discuss uh, those, those issues in this, in this talk. I will more concentrate on our own approach to understand the formation of dwarf galaxies. So we run lots of uh, zoom-in numerical simulation, cosmological simulation, and um, at every step in our um, research, we really try to, to um, compare the prediction of our model a very accurate way with all available ob observations. And I think it's very important here to um, insist on the fact that we have access now to a huge, a huge amount of, of data. Uh, we have a very good idea of the, the dynamics of dwarf galaxies thanks to line of side velocities. We have very deep color magnitude diagrams, so we have a good idea how was uh, about the, the star formation histories of the, those objects. Uh, very important is the fact that we have high resolu resolution spectra of individual stars in dwarf galaxies, so this gives us a very good understanding of the combination of the stars, so of the chemical evolution of these uh, objects. Now, thanks to Gaia, we also have very accurate orbits. So we understood those last year that uh, dwarf galaxies are much more complex objects that we, we 
we saw there were before. Uh, they show variety of star formation histories, multiple stellar population, gradients, um, prolate rotation, and so on and so forth. So that's all this kind of, of feature that we must now, as simulator, uh, reproduce. So as I told you, we perform uh, zoom-in numerical estimation that has been done with our own code, GEAR, which is an evolution of Gadget 2, so we simply implemented uh, additional physics, and uh, we concentrated um, on reproducing dwarf galaxy with a luminosity between 10 to the 3, 10 to the 8. Uh, yeah, I want, just wanted also to mention that we are now moving uh, towards GEAR, towards three-story GEAR, by the way, participated with the, the Agora Comparison Project, and we'll replace soon with Swift. Um, so let me first show you uh, some results we did some years ago about understanding dwarf galaxy with a luminosity between 10 to the 5, 10 to the 8 solar luminosity. This is one of our movie. This is the uh, refined region. Uh, in red, you have the cosmic wave, the dark matter. In blue here, you see a zoom. So that's the gas and the, the stars in, in um, yellow. That's um, explode supernova, so this generates this precipitation of the, of the galaxy, and at the end of the day, you obtain a nice dwarf galaxy embedded in, in a massive dark halo. Okay, the first thing we want to, to check obtaining those simulations is to see if they um, reproduce the well-known scaling relation. So here, you have the velocity, sorry, the, the luminosity of the dwarf as a function of the velocity dispersion here that the metallicity as the function of the luminosity, and here that the half-life radius, so the size as a function of the velocity. In all these plots, the data are in black. The blue point corresponds to our um, simulation, so we are doing pretty well over four, something like four order of, of magnitude. The point that Aaron mentioned is that if you look at this, the scale here predicted, the scatter is very low compared to the observation, so that's something that will have to be uh, understood in the future. Uh, but as I told you, it's important to go beyond this uh, scaling relation, looking in more detail. And here I concentrate only on dwarf with a luminosity between 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Uh, we saw that all our models were quenched systems, so they are very good candidate to reproduce galaxies like Ursa Maidan, Draco, Sexton. If we look at the properties, so star formation is quenched. That's the direct uh, impact of organization, so the strong UV uh, background that remove the gas. If we now look at um, more detailed properties, for example, we can reproduce the metallicity distribution function. In blue, that's our prediction. In red, that the, the, the observation from Osa Minor. We also get, we are also able to reproduce the alpha element with more or less the correct scatter, the, the decrease due to al supernova alpha pollution. And we have the velocity um, dispersion profile, which is also correct. We're very happy with all that. Uh, I wanted to mention very quickly that we also observe metallicity gradients and prolate rotation, but I don't have time to, to go into detail there. What, is, what we cannot reproduce is this typical, uh, very special galaxy like Leo T, Leo P, very faint system, so with a luminosity less than 10 to the 6, that are still forming stars, so still linked to, to gas. Apparently, those galaxies survive the reionization epoch, that's something we can definitely not reproduce. Um, from our model, it's possible to have a look at the stellar mass, uh, halo mass relation. What I wanted to emphasize here is the very large um, scatter we have in this plot. So the blue points are our models that other um, that prediction of other team. Well, by the way, sorry, this, this plot is really old now. I should have added there are many other group that, that have point now in this plot. Anyway, the large scatter here which I think is important, is definitely the direct consequence of the different build-up histories of those, those dwarf galaxies. It has nothing to do with interaction or something else. Good. Having this relation, it's, we can quickly look at if we will, with our model, uh, produce a random number of uh, satellites around the Milky Way. So this is what you see here, that the cumulative number of galaxies around the, the, the Milky Way as a function of their luminosity the dash, the, well, the, the black area here, that's our predictions compared to the dark experiment uh, survey in red and black. Keep in mind that, I mean, we are doing zoom-in simulation, so we don't take into account 
uh, the interaction with uh, the Milky Way. So that has, but has to be taken with a pinch of, so of salt. Good. Uh, having all this in place, um, I told you that we can use dwarf galaxies to um, constrain the smaller scale. This is an example where, in fact, indirectly, we've seen that we can obtain information, we can constrain existing, uh, well, primarily a magnetic field that could exist prior to renalization uh, that impacts the power spectrum. I will show you how this works. Imagine that you have, for some reason, um, there is imagine that there are magnetic fields that exist prior to reionization. Those will, of course, couple with the gas, and together, through gravity, they will couple to the dark matter. And the direct impact is that you will modify the power spectrum, the total matter of power spectrum, at very small scale. If you assume that your primary magnetic fields are, well, the, the power law, sorry, the, the power spectrum of the primary magnetic field is a simple power law with an amplitude B lambda, a slope index N, and to use machinery to see how this impacts the power spectrum, this is what you get. In fact, you see at very small scale, in fact, at the scale of the dwarf galaxy, you see some bumps here. So you expect direct influence on your dwarf galaxy. This is what I get when I fix the amplitude and modify the slope. This is what I get when I modify the slope and fix, sorry, modify the amplitude and, and fix the, the slope. So what we did is that we use this uh, initial total matter of spectrum, we run our zoom-in simulation and see what is the impact. So that's pure dark matter only simulation, so that's the unperturbed models, and there are uh, different cases with different value of this initial uh, power spectrum, so we, we don't see well here. But anyway, you will slightly change the population of halos, uh, either directly impacting, well, either the, the size of the dwarf or the, the small uh, population of halos. We quantify that, this is the <coughs> the number of halo as a function of the, the mass, and uh, focus may be on this model, the cyan one, where the effect is the largest. You see that you deviate from, from this power law, and if you, if you compare the unperturbed case with the perturbed case, you see that you will simply increase the number of halo at a given mass, and the mass again here is something like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. <coughs> Now, the, this is very important because this, this will directly impact on the number of uh, dwarf galaxies you will see around the Milky Way, and that's some interesting results. We see that so that's some models that are weakly perturbed, but you see that in some extreme cases, you strongly overpredict the number of satellites. So that's the kind of model you can definitely rule out. Another impact, which is more or less similar in, on the reionization of the universe, because you overproduce the number of dwarf galaxies, um, you will have a much higher number of ionizing photons early on in the universe, and this will directly re that will uh, help in reionizing the, the, the universe much earlier. So we have several models that are not so strongly perturbed that fits observed data, so you reionize the universe about up to redshift of six. However, some extreme cases reionizes at redshift of 100. So all this to say that using this model, we can simply reject some assumption about the shape or the, the properties of parameter magnetic fields. In the remaining few minutes I have, I would like to concentrate on new potential issues uh, that I call ultra small scale issues. So here, in fact, I will show you that if you try to reproduce ultra faint galaxies, so galaxies with a luminosity below 10 to the 5, there are still some problems. So we'll talk about the metallicity luminosity relation as well as the size luminosity relation. So let's first start with the metallicity, metallicity uh, luminosity relation. So that's the observation. So if you, well, you see a nice correlation between the metallicity observed and the luminosity of the dwarf. Makes sense. I mean, if you have more stars, um, you reject, you create more metals, the system is, is expected to be uh, more enriched. However, we see that when we enter the regime of the ultra faint, it seems that this, uh, this um, correlation slightly flattened. This is a bit debated. Anyway, the interesting thing is that now, what happens if you compare that with prediction of the model? Well, see that the majority, the large majority of the models, that's hydrodynamical models, completely under predicts the metallicity here. And I insist on the fact that all those groups are using completely different um, codes, different implementation of the physics and so on and so forth. So there, there is definitely a problem, except for few cases, there are 
here two points. I mean, the galaxy produced by Myung-Hong Jun, uh, she's able to obtain and reach faint systems. Well, however, look at this, this point uh, there, she still has a very large dispersion. The interesting point is that she's using population tree stars. And there is another interesting point here from the Oscar um, group where they, they have no population tree stars, but they um, use the metallicilipin and IMF. I, sorry, I don't have to, to enter the detail here, but they are able to boost the, the metallicity here. The, the idea we have is how can we understand the effect of population tree? In fact, the, 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 the motivation was that um, the majority of these people here don't include population tree in the, the model. So what we expect as the effect of population tree is the following is that, I mean, you could have a population that's enriched, that's helped to, to bring more metals. So you push those, those, those models up. And if you, are if you have a um, top heavy IMF, those massive stars will simply disappear. So you will uh, lose luminosity and move to the left here. So that's something we wanted to test. So we upgraded our code. We improved the resolution. Now the stellar resolution is down to 40 solar masses. We run 18 ultra faint dwarfs and one sex sunlight for calibration. We had to update also different things. In our uh, code, we have new yields. So we adopted the Japanese yield, Nomoto and Kobayashi. We consider different kind of massive stars, core collapse supernova that explode. We consider failed supernova, so that's massive stars that uh, completely collapse into the black hole. So they're part of the IMF, but they don't contribute in terms of yield. And so very important, we consider parent stability supernova. That's the opposite of failed supernova. Those, get those stars completely explode. You explode the iron core, so you provide, you get a lot of iron that's shown here this plot where I show the, the iron ejected as a function of the progenitor mass and the parent stability are uh, here and you see you have a jump in the projection of iron. So those stars could play an, an important role. We also consider, of course, two IMF pop trees. So when the metallicity of the gas is less than minus five, we generate pop tree stars with a top heavy MF mass of stars above 13 solar masses and um, when the gas is enriched, we use a normal crop IMF. So, uh, yeah, I told you that we run a sexton like system, important. We wanted to really um, be sure that we can reproduce in great detail the abundances observed in the sexton galaxy. So here that's the Mg, the cal magnesium and calcium over iron. And we see that we have the plateau rise, we have the decrease, which is also quite well reproduced as well as uh, the scatter. So with our new model, uh, we run ultra faint simulations. And the first thing we understood is that um, ultra faint are quenched systems. That's not really a surprise, but you see that here. So that's a sextant system. That's two uh, faint systems. This one has only a luminosity of 10 to the three. And we s you see that they are quenched after one giga year. The, sorry, that's the stellar fraction of, as a function of time. Uh, you see that if in a sextant like galaxy, the population is dominated by POP2. That's not the case in uh, uh, an ultra fan. It is dominated by population three star up to 80%. So 80% of the stars form could be um, population three star. So definitely they should play a role. What is now the impact on the metallicity luminosity relation? This is shown here. So just concentrate on the blue points. The blue are the run without population two. The red are the one um, with population uh, tree and uh, well, that's our most advanced model. And uh, the net effect here is that you move a little bit upwards those those models. So we you reconcile a little bit this this um, model with the, the observation. However, that does not work for faint systems. So and the reason is that in this faint system, the probability of having a parent stability that provides huge amount of metal is simply zero. So you don't move those those. Uh, so uh, because I'm apparently a bit running out of time, now let me just comment on this plot. Uh, that's a comparison between the metallicity distribution between our models and the observation. Our models are in red, observation in blue, and they are beans in two luminosity um, range. So more luminous faint galaxies, and that's the very faint one. And we see that's where the this frequency is the strongest. It is explained by the presence in the observation 
of metal rich stars. So by I mean uh, stars with a metallicity of about minus one, so that's metal poor, but I mean for us it's metal rich. And those stars, I mean definitely, well, we cannot reproduce in our model. Um, very quickly, I wanted to finish with the size limit relation. That's another very interesting thing here. In fact, you look at the correlation between the size of the system and the luminosity. Faint system um, are smaller. This is pretty clear here. And I, f I insist on the fact that they are so very compact with a size which are lower than 100 parsecs, even some cases lower than 30 parsecs. So this is extremely compact. Now, if you compare that with observation, this is where we are. So no models actually is able to reproduce this very compact ultra faint dwarf galaxy. So I think this is a very interesting point. So where is the problem? Is it due to lack of resolution, kind of numerical heating? Or is it due to the fact that we are using too strong feedback that generates uh, star formation which is too bursty? That may be a possibility. Another thing uh, we are thinking about is what could be the effect, simply the effect of the galaxy buildup? I will explain that through this movie. In fact, that's a, a zoom in of a, one of our ultra faint. I stopped the, the movie at redshift of six, and the red point corresponds to the, the place of the cluster, the star cluster that we at the end at redshift of zero um, build the entire ultra faint, right? What you see there, in fact, that the, at the end of the star formation period, those clusters are completely physically disconnected. And then, so you can imagine that they will behave nearly collision, uh, nearly collision in less way. So how can you get something which is compact? I mean, this is some, something which is certainly difficult, right? So what we did is to run very simple experiments. So because um, you can assume that everything behave nearly a uh, collisionless way, we run uh, seven ultra faint dark matter only simulations with a very high resolution. So the dark matter particles have a value of 77 solar masses. So the, the gravitational surfing is less than one parsec. And so you run the simulation, you stop the simulation at redshift of six. Once the stars are supposed to be um, formed, all formed, and then you select the halo that you know that will build up the final system and you, you paint you define clusters by uh, dark matter particles that, that are the most gravitationally bounded. Okay, and that defines uh, your stellar cluster in some sense, and let you run the simulation, and you see what is the evolution of, the, of those, um, those clusters in terms of, of size. So I will show you two movies. Before, let me explain what you will see here on the left, that's simply the evolution in the configuration space that I painted the particles different clusters with different colors. The main one is always in red. And here you will see that's the evolution of the size of these different clusters. So in this first case, we, the, 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 the ultra faint is built out of five clusters. Um, and uh, so let me run the movie. So at redshift of six, we select our cluster. So here, okay, and then we see the evolution of this, this stuff here. You see that at the beginning they are compact and as soon as, of course, they interact, the size strongly increase. The, the black curve here shows the final half-light radius of the system. And in this case, it is above 100. So there is no way to obtain something which is compact, makes sense. This dotted curve, by the way, show the resolution of the, of the simulation. Now there is another uh, system, is this one. So here, it, in fact, the system is much uh, simpler. It is made out of only uh, one cluster. Forget about this one. This one at the end do does not merge with the, the main one. You see that the size is nearly constant until a redshift of one, where suddenly you have a strong increase, and that's due to the merger with the completely dark halo. So you see that simply merger with dark halo simply increases the size of the system. OK. I didn't tell you, but that's really preliminary uh, results, so be careful about that. But what I learned from out of that is that definitely it's super difficult to obtain extremely compact objects in a hierarchical scenario. Uh, we've not been able to obtain a system with a half-life radius which is much, much smaller than 30. That is interesting because that gives us constraint on the halo mass. I mean, if you have a big halo, you expect lots of merger, so you will never be able to form something compact. We've seen that it's possible to obtain um, 
ultrafine with a size between 30 and, and 50, but again, this requires very speci special, well, few, few, few mergers, so again, a constraint on the halo mass, as well as a constraint on the size of the cluster at redshift of six. So if it is larger than 10 parsec, you are basically dead. It's easier to obtain, to reproduce cluster, uh, ultrafine, sorry, with a mass between uh, 50 and 100, but again, the cluster must be quite small at redshift of six. So what you can obtain out of this is that, I mean, if you want to obtain or reproduce compact dwarf galaxy, you really need to start with very compact cluster that provide you very, I think, strong constraint on the, on the feedback. Okay, uh, and I think uh, I will simply leave you with my conclusions. Thank you, Yves. Uh, questions, especially again from junior members of the audience. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, extremely fascinating work, I loved it. So it seems to be the perfect type of simulation where, a te where you, you can use it as a test bed for particle nature of dark matter. Have you considered doing that? <laughs> of course. No, it's just a matter of time. So that's, of course, the, the idea. I mean, if we are unable to reproduce compact object in, in a lambda CDM model, yeah, why not considering self-interacting? Or, I mean, if you cut the, the poor spectrum with warm dark matter, that will probably play a role. But no, that, that's, that's some work which, is, which we started very, uh, well, a few months ago, so we didn't consider that yet. But of course, that's the idea. Any questions? Thank you for an interesting talk. I was curious, what fraction of the final dwarf galaxies comprised of the parts of garbage clusters that had been either entirely stripped or oh, sorry, broke? I, I what fraction understand. of the final dwarf galaxy is comprised of former globular clusters that have been torn apart or so ripped up? Sorry, how many, you ask how many what dwarf galaxies contain globular clusters? No, what fraction of the stars of the dwarf galaxy at the end resulted from earlier body clusters that were stripped. So this I, I never checked through simulation myself, so I cannot really tell you here. Okay, because I was wondering, well, is there a difference between the melancholy of the goblet clusters from that of the dwarf galaxy, or are they the same? The metallicity of the stars. No, there is a huge difference between dwarf galaxies and globular clusters in the sense that if you look at globular clusters, they are Usually the metallicity, well, it's not their exception, but the metallicity distribution is really narrow, yes. while in dwarf galaxies, it's much broader. That's the way we differentiate between dwarf galaxies and, and, um, and globular clusters, right? Yes. Um, and yeah. therefore, the fraction of globulars that have been mixed into the dwarf galaxy will then affect that metallicity. That's the reason I'm yeah. asking about the mixture. So thank you. Okay, let's thank you again.